Okay. So, um... Hi again, everybody. I do geoarchaeology. I already sort of gave you the thumbnail version of that. It means I apply geological stuff to archaeological questions. Uh, Geoarchaeologists do a lot of different sorts of things. The particular bit of it that I'm doing here has to do with site formation processes. So this is something that um, people kind of realized was an issue a long time ago, but generally just ignored that issue up until about the late 70s when a guy named Mike Schiffer started screaming about it at everybody. Sometimes literally in conferences, he would shout at them, <laughs> you weren't thinking about how blah, blah, blah got there. <laughs> and it all comes down to something pretty simple. You probably recognize these images as mm. being from a very, 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 very famous archaeological site. The site of Pompeii. Pompeii. Mm. Uh, it's in Italy. Yeah. It was a Roman town, and this is sort of what happened to it. Mm. Everybody's hanging out there. One day they wake up and the, the volcano goes boom and covers up the whole town with a pyroclastic, you know, hot ash, basically. Covers up everything. They hear the rumble. They have time to get scared and kind of huddle down and go, oh dear. And then, boom, they're entombed in this stuff. And um, the site in this particular case is frozen in time. So whatever people are doing, they have a few minutes to, to pick up. Some of them run away. They, they sort of start running away early on when the mountain starts smoking. But uh, a lot of people are caught there, and they're kind of caught doing pretty close to whatever it was they would normally be doing during the day. And what Schiffer was talking about was something he called the Pompeii premise. We were just assuming that every site out there is like this. And, of course, obviously the reality is that that's not the case. There's a lot of different things that happen in between what we're interested in, which is human behavior in the past, and what we see today, which is, well, you guys have been seeing it, a bunch of little tiny bits of broken rock buried somewhere in the dirt. And it's a little hard to get from one to the other. I mean, you guys can sort of conceptually think about somebody making tools, but knowing a little bit more than that is a very difficult thing to get to in a lot of cases. So we study site formation processes, all of those things that move stuff from where it's used to where we eventually find it. And it's called taphonomy if you're doing fossils or, you know, doing hominid fossils and then you call it paleoanthropology if you're still doing taphonomy. Um, so you can click from it. Great. Um, Schiffer divided this stuff up into two different things. Cultural processes, which he called sea transforms, and natural processes, which inventively is and transforms. Um, so, cultural proce processes, stuff that uh, creates and alters the record that we're looking at. And this encompasses, encompasses a whole lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that we're actually interested in, because a lot of it is behavior in the past <laughs> that we're trying to get to, uh, making, fixing, and using things. So when you make something, you create waste products as well as the thing that you're creating. And if you're a modern day flint napper, you're sitting there pounding away on rocks to make them into sharper, smaller rocks. And what do you do? You put out a tarp and you catch all of those sharp bits because presumably you don't want them wherever you are. And in the past, if you're a hunter out on the Vias Caldera and you pick a nice little spot to sit down for lunch and watch for something to walk by and you're sharpening your, your spear points or whatever it is you have, you're probably not doing that. Now, what about if it's the Puebloan period and you actually live in a house kind of thing? What do you think? Are you going to sit in your living room and crack glass together and have your little kids running around barefoot in the glass? Probably not. You're going to start taking out the trash. So you're going to, you know, not being really kind and thinking ahead a few hundred years to some poor archaeologist who has to figure out what you were doing, you're going to clean up after yourself and make our lives a little bit more difficult. So another thing you do, recycle stuff. This is not some new idea that came along in the 1970s. It's an idea that's been around for a long time. This is a a pot from southern Arizona that's several hundred years old, and when it broke, they drilled little holes in it, stitched it back together, and sealed it with pine tar, and kept on using it. So, reusing things, 
This is another thing you do with pot shards. You grind them down and you use them for other, other purposes. Um, if you found just this in the archaeological record, you'd probably be a little bit confused as to what a Volkswagen bug is. So this is the cultural side of it. The part I'm working on more is the natural side of it. Natural transforms. Things that change the record during and after deposition that people are not directly involved with. So, some things disintegrate and others don't. We're out there working on this quarry site that's probably been used by people for 10,000 plus years. And what do we see? We see the rocks. We don't see their sandals. We don't see the animals that they're eating. We don't see all of those other things that have disintegrated and are gone from the archaeological record at this point. This is a pretty obvious example of something that's going to screw up an archaeological site. If you had a big campsite right here before the debris flow, it's not really there anymore. The campsite is now somewhere down here, and you can still find bits of it. And as a geoarchaeologist, it's my job to try to look at that and say, well, this isn't really where the campsite is. We're finding stuff here, but the behaviors we're interested in happen up there. So sorting out some of those things, this is just a real large scale example, that's Anna for scale. Um, that happens on really small scales as well. And that's part of what I'm trying to do at the site that we're working on, is figure out, okay, so when it rains, some stuff goes downhill just a little bit, and when it rains really hard, it goes downhill a little bit more. And in some places it blows out like this, but in other places, it's pretty near where it was in the past. And trying to figure out which is which is the challenge that I'm working with. So we've got that whole burial, erosion, transport, redeposition. And then there's this whole other issue of in situ mixing. So in, in place mixing. So the soil science fancy geology kind of term for mixing is turbation. And you have bioturbation, which is living things. They're churning stuff up. Cryoturbation, when yes. you freeze the sediments, it moves mm -hmm. things around. Argilloturbation, not really as much of an issue up here, but when you have really clayey soils. Mm -hmm. You guys have probably seen soil crack open. And I know a guy that was working on an archaic period site out in Kentucky, and he's up excavating way near the top of this thing, up in some, some late prehistoric deposits and drops his big pen one day. His big pen shows up in the early archaic several months later and just fell right down one of these soil cracks. So it can create serious problems with stratigraphy, which is one of the most basic ways that we date anything in archaeology. So what I'm really trying to get at in the work here is these last two things. Because I know we're going to be dealing mostly with rock. I can already just sort of figure that out from Go and um, try to figure out how far stuff has moved, what caused it to move, and then has it been mixed up and down within the soil column. Um, here are some of the, our friends that help us with this bioturbation thing. Gophers, <laughs> the Thamomis boidii, pocket gopher. There's actually been quite a few studies in archaeology of what these guys do to archaeological sites. <laughs> and believe me, they're pretty busy up here in the caldera, them and, and their other little fuzzy friends, digging around in the sediments and moving stuff around. This guy claims to be helping water flow through the soil. Um, in that little graphic, he also does something else. He helps artifacts move around in the soil. Um, random piece of trivia, anyone here know the person who did the very first study of how earthworms move artifacts in the soil Darwin, column? Darwin. Darwin. Darwin, yes. Who told you that? That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. I'm glad you know that. I've never had an audience where anyone knew that, and I think it's really oh, pretty really? cool. But yeah. he wrote an entire book on it. Yes. Um, right. So they're moving things around in the soil in ways that have been studied, and we actually know how they're moving things, which, what patterns they're going to create. When a tree falls over, it also picks up a whole bunch of soil and sediments and rocks and all whatever's there that's in the root ball and tips it way up in the air and then it sits there and it gets rained on and the dirt kind of washes away and eventually the tree trunk disintegrates and you're left with a pile of rocks there. And as an archaeologist, you might come along and go, oh look, a cairn. 
cool. <laughs> you know, somebody built this thing in the past, and it's actually it's just a, a completely natural phenomenon. And there's several kind of embarrassing cases where archaeologists have reported thousands of analogous things as being cultural items on the landscape that actually turn out not to be. So these are the things I'm trying to sort out here, and luckily smart people like Darwin have done some work that I can use. So there's a whole bunch of different things to look at. The first one, um, partly just because I like soils and I spend a lot of time working with soils, looking at soils and buried soils for clues. So soils are, um, they have a different meaning to everybody. If you're a farmer, it's where you put seed and it's what gives those seeds some nutrients and some water. If you're an engineer, it's something that you have to pack down in certain ways to build stuff on it. If you're a geologist or a soil scientist, it's basically just rock that is broken down and weathered, and there's these processes that have changed it in very predictable ways. Um, there's the, the, the famous fart equation. Soil is a function of additions, removals, transformations, and translocations. So what's going on here is we've got this soil column, a stable surface that's sitting there, and you are adding stuff to the top, organic material. You're also removing stuff from the top. You're taking things like very, very small particles of clay that are in that near surface part, and when it rains, you're washing them downward through the soil profile into this V horizon, this zone of accumulation. There are also certain things that you're removing from it. Up here at high eleva elevations where there's enough water, we're taking calcium carbonate and flushing it completely through the soil column. Down lower in New Mexico in the deserts, it'll build up down in those B horizons, and it's actually pretty useful for a lot of things. And then, um, so translocations and then transformations. You're changing things in the soil, stuff that's up here in that, in that near surface environment. And you create this ABC horizonation. And in an undisturbed soil, that's what you're gonna see. So knowing that that's what it looks like if it's not disturbed, you can look and see if there's something else there and learn a little bit about how it's been churned around, whether stuff's been put down on top of it, whether that stuff got there quickly or slowly. Um, you may have a buried soil. You know that that was a stable surface in the past mm -hmm. that got covered up fairly quickly. It's a good place to look for intact archeological deposits. The degree of soil formation, how well you can differentiate these horizons, how thick they are, how red that B horizon is, all of that tells you something about the age of the surface, how long it was stable. So you can do some, it's kind of a blunt instrument, you can do some dating by looking at the soils. The pattern of horizonation is affected by mixing. If you've got lots of our friendly little fuzzy critters there, they're going to make those different A, B, C things harder to see. And in some cases, you won't be able to see them at all. Um, and then the thickness of it, if you are up here and you expect a normal kind of A horizon, and you get an A horizon, <laughs> and you're somewhere near the bottom of a slope, you can kind of think, well, stuff's probably been washing down on here for a very long period of time. That's what's called accumulic soil. On the other hand, if you're slightly higher up on the slope, and you look, and your A horizon is this thick, and you got a big old B horizon there, that's probably where that stuff that's down at the bottom of the slope came from. It got washed off. So you know what patterns to expect in a stable soil, and you study how different what you're looking at is from those expected patterns. And that's, that's what we're doing here. These are pictures from the caldera. And Stuck Adam down in a hole there, measuring where he's taking little samples from and looking at stuff. This is one of the measured profile drawings I've put together. And unfortunately, that's not very clear, but in this one, there's these sort of dark stripes that run all oh, through yeah. the bottom of there. Rodent, rodent disturbances. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that little rodent's former house mm -hmm. yeah. before we dug it up. And in one case, we dug one up when the rodent was still trying to use it. Yeah. And he was not real happy about it. You know, he scuttled off to some other part of his burrow, but we came back the next day. He had thrown half of a five-gallon bucket of dirt into our unit in one night. That's how much dirt these guys can move around. So multiply that one night out by years and years, and you can get a lot of mixing of sediments. 
So, looking at the soils, then you look at all these other processes and figure out which ones create which patterns. And so this is where you go and you read that book by Darwin and you read some other stuff. And if you're looking at a slope process, if you're looking at stuff washing down a slope, the pattern that that's going to create is horizontal sorting. The big stuff's going to land mm -hmm. kind of near the bottom of the slope. And then as that, the power of that water that's moving it diminishes, moving out across the bottom, you're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller stuff. So you look across space, and you can see size sorting. If you get mass movements, like the one that Anna was in for scale, again, you're going to get very specific sorts of things. The stuff that lands at the bottom typically is going to be poorly sorted. You've got all different sizes of clasps all mixed into it. It's randomly oriented, so if you look at which direction the clasps are pointed relative to their longest um, axis, it'll be whatever direction. You get moraine-like features around the edges, so kind of these sort of borders to mm -hmm. it, and what's called the bouldery snout right at the end. It just At some point it runs out of energy and all the big stuff just ends right at, at the end of it. And it looks kind of like somebody drove a bulldozer so far and just stopped. So you can kind of tell what you're looking at that way. Argillo and cryo, cryoturbation and floral turbation, where the tree tips stuff up, all of those things move larger clasts upward to the surface. So if you've got stuff buried down in the soil horizons, it'll bring it right up to the top and create a pavement. Faunal turbation, where you've got the bugs and the bunnies and the worms and all of those things churning stuff around, moves those larger class downward and creates a stone line somewhere down in your soil horizons. So as they're burrowing around, they burrow under stuff. And when they do, their little things cave in and it moves down. And it basically all ends up right down at the bottom of whatever depth they're digging to on a regular basis. So those are the different possible patterns. Then you do the next logical thing and you go out and look for those patterns. And that's what you guys have been doing, mm -hmm. is collecting the data that allows us to identify these patterns. So we're looking for the distribution of clasps. That's just the geology term for chunks of stuff that's out there. Anything that's bigger than what would be classified as like a sand grain is called a clasp. Mm -hmm. And that includes all of your artifacts. And so you go through the stuff and you size sort it and you count it, and you weigh it, and you get all this information about what's where. You plot the abundance against the depth, and this is you know, one example of that, where it's all sorted out by different size classes. And then over here I'm comparing just the counts to the, to the weight, so that's another way of measuring, you know, where's the big stuff, where's the little stuff, so I can start to sort out, well, is the big stuff going up, is it going down? Are we looking at, you know, bugs and bunnies, or are we looking at something else? Compare your different units, the different places that you're excavating, and you try to identify, okay, here's the patterns I'm seeing, what are the processes that created these patterns? And ideally, you can try to find a place where you get a pattern that's telling you that, oh, this is a buried surface where probably we've got some more intact archaeological deposits. Or in this particular area, we've got less churning, and in that particular area, we've got more. And then, you see where all of these different processes are more active across the sites, and you use that to plan your resource, resource management and your future research. So this is putting it all together for um, what we're, we've been calling the village site. I was going to say, so um, we stopped at the site. Mm -hmm. um, this is LA26917, so it's the one where the road was through it that we stopped at the first day. The road, yeah, we yeah, now okay, drive across yeah. it each mm -hmm. day to go mm -hmm. out to the site. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why it's come here. Yeah. Yeah. And I've managed to not call it the village site because it so disturbs Chris. But mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yes, the habitation use area. Oh. I like it being a village oh. site, but mm -hmm. um, Chris makes him his skin crawl. So yeah, but, I have different ideas He's about gone, what so villages might be because I've looked at basket maker villages that are really not villages in the sense that we think of it. It's just a place where people kept going back to. So you can identify these where these different patterns are across your site, and then you can start to then take apart that puzzle that ultimately will get you back to the behaviors that people were doing in the past. You can find the places where you can look for 
in this case, we've got some buried stable surfaces that we were able to identify. And you can say, well, that's where you're most likely to find something like the hearth, for example, that hasn't been all chewed up. And something that is a much more direct reflection of what people were doing in the past. And you can also find parts of the site that you can say, well, that's, that's pretty chewed up. There's not likely to be a lot of information there. And if you're going to put a road in, which you are, that's probably a good place to put it. So you can start using it for both management and research purposes. I forgot to put in a, 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 another one of those The things that I was doing was obsidian hydration. Because we're getting hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of these artifacts. And we took, because it's so cheap, we got very large sample sizes. And we were submitting hundreds of these things for dating. And that we could look at the hydration rind width by depth for each mm -hmm. of these different, different excavation units. And there were enough of them that it also made sense to look at something like the statistical variability as you go down. So you can find places where you get sort of a pattern of narrow bands at the top and then thicker bands as you go down through the soil and, and think, okay, this is much less, you know, churned up. Or they're kind of the same all the way along. It's a lot of churning. And then you look at that standard deviation for each of those levels. Mm -hmm. And if you have a really low standard deviation within each one, then it's, again, low churning. And if you're going on down and you find this stone line and you get a really huge standard deviation, oh, okay, the bugs and bunnies left that there for me. They brought everything, churned it up, and left it all right in this one unit. Everything from all these time periods mixed together. So you combine all of these different pieces of information, and eventually you're able to come out with, at least a pretty good story for what you think was happening on different parts of the site since people left it. I think I have one more slide. What are the axes? I'm sorry? What were the axes on that? The axis, axis, the axis, the axis, the axis, oh, this is a, imagine if you just dug a, a trench straight up and down yeah. the slope. Mm. Oh, okay. And so what we're looking at here is the, the kind of the cross hatching is bedrock. And then we've got, these are the marked locations for everywhere that we dug um, excavation units and soil test pits. And um, then the inferred depositional units going up and down the slope. When we were standing on that road, so the top of That's the ridge, we were standing right about here. Oh, okay, yeah. When we were standing on that road yeah, where you yeah. go past the gate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this was the top of the ridge up here. Mm -hmm. This was the creek down here. Down the and we were right about here. Mm -hmm. yep. What's this called, this whole thing? It's one of my favorite words. Patina. Mm. If I had a daughter, I would have named her Katina. Mm. <laughs> I thought it was Calcetina. Oh, oh. Uh, C A T E N A is oh, Katina. 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 So yeah. it's a soil Katina. Yep. And uh, a Katina actually specifically refers to the variation that you expect in soils along a slope because normally you're going to be fairly stable up at the top. You're going to have erosion here along the upper part of the slope, deposition down at the lower part of the slope, and then stability again out in the flat areas. And so you can look at the, the pattern variation in soils along that slope. There's a whole journal, a whole scientific journal that's called Katina, and it's devoted to looking at that sort of thing. should have a journal named after There you go, yeah. Oh, <laughs> how you missed all of them. And then, of course, once you've done that at one site, you expand it out and start comparing it to other sites. So this is the, the village people here, the, the, the site that Anna is no longer calling a village. No, I'm still calling a village. It's not when, not when not Chris, when Chris is, here. is around, okay. right? Um, and then this is the site that we're working on right now. And the one of the main questions I'm trying to get at, you know, once we get all of the data, this one is a south-facing slope. This one is a north-facing slope. Mm -hmm. I expect that that makes a difference as you go back through geologic time and you get things like the mid-Holocene climate optimum. And, you know, all of the variability between relatively warmer, relatively cooler during the past 10 to 15,000 years should have more of an impact on a south-facing slope. And so that's something that I want to try to test out. Has there been a lot more movement of sediment coming down this slope Versus this slope, which even with all of the, the fires and the rain and the massive landscape change that we're seeing out there right now, this has been remarkably stable. After I saw what that fire did, I expected to come out there and see just loads of stuff stacking up at the bottom of that slope. And what we found is, what, maybe 10 centimeters of charcoal. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't a whole lot of change, geomorphically speaking, on this north-facing slope 
even as we're going through a warming climate and getting lots of these big fires and then rainstorms afterwards. So I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit at slope stability on that larger scale and see what differences the aspect makes. And you guys are helping by sorting artifacts and counting them and all of that good stuff. So thanks for doing that all day. Um, <laughs> any questions? Don't you have more, you have more than one slope there though? There are multiple slopes, of yeah. course. I mean, every slope is sort of com complicated in its own way. And on this one, we did do um, our, our transects up and down, the different sort of the mm. different mm -hmm. aspects of that one general aspect. Right. And the other thing you have to worry about is, well, am I on something that's concave or convex? Am I focusing water mm -hmm. in one place or mm -hmm. am I spreading it out? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of complexity to it. And they can overlap. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for listening. Yeah. Thank you.